Hello and welcome to the podcast that will help you to improve your English and take it to the next level. Now, if this is your first time listening, I usually have a regular co-host, my good friend and ex-colleague Reza, but he's not with me this week. However, I'm delighted to welcome as a very special guest, Kirsty from the podcast and the website English with Kirsty. Welcome to Aprender Inglés with Kirsty and Craig. Kirsty, hello. Thank you so much for joining me. Welcome. Hi, thank you. It's great to be here on your podcast. Lovely to have you. Now, what I like to do to start off is to ask where your English accent is from. So can you tell us a bit about that and also where you're based at the moment? Okay, well, my English accent is um, from a number of places because I've moved around the country. I was born in London and then I moved to Hampshire in the south of England and then I lived in Yorkshire for a while in the north and now I'm back in the south of England again. So it's basically a southern English accent. I was born in London, but I don't speak like somebody who um, necessarily was born in London when you listen to the rest of my family. So yeah, it's just a a standard English accent and now I'm, I'm based um, to the west of London about an hour to the west of London in Hampshire again um, but I work across Europe I have customers in, in a number of countries other European countries. And as far as I know you speak several languages obviously English we can hear that but German, Romanian, is it Turkish as well? How many, how many languages do you speak? Yeah, I've, I've started a number. My, my first one was French, and unfortunately, I've forgotten all my French. I had French at school and German, so German, I really enjoyed that, and I decided to continue with it. So German is my oldest additional language, because I started it at school, and I still use that now in my business. And then Romanian was a something to do in the lockdown project. I still worked during the lockdown, but I had more free time, and I thought it'd be nice to do something useful with this free time and to learn another language. And so I started Romanian in 2021. And then recently, I decided to learn European Portuguese as well. So that's I'm right back at the beginning. It will not complete beginning now because I started last year. But I think it's really good for, I mean, I do it because I'm interested in languages and I enjoy learning them. But I also think it's really good for English teachers to be language learners too, because then you know some of the challenges and you can understand how how your students feel sometimes because you're also going through that process of learning another language yeah i really admire that it's just that i'm such a bad student even with spanish <laughs> and <laughs> i just yeah i struggle with the verb tenses i struggle with fluency which is also something you you might be able to to help the listeners with what tips and advice would you give for language learners who want to improve their fluency that you must have come across that in your experience learning languages, how to be more fluent, more communicative, more effective? Yeah, I think it's a big struggle. And something with, with learning languages at the beginning, you have the most challenges with this, because once you've progressed to a higher level, then you can express yourself more, you know more words, it's easier to work on your fluency. But at the beginning, it's quite hard. And I think many of us, there's like a, a scale between accuracy and, and flu fluency. So accuracy is whether you get everything right, and, and fluency is, is how much you're able to communicate and how easily that comes across how, how well you can get your ideas across and most of us tend to to go towards one end of this scale so for me it's I focus too much on the accuracy I want everything to be perfect and all my verb tenses to be correct and all my adjectives to be beautiful and so that can really impact on your fluency sometimes because you don't say anything until it's right. I remember at school one of my German teachers said, Kirsty, what you say is usually right, but you'll never progress if you don't take some risks and try some harder constructions that, that may be wrong, but you know, you'll never get any further unless you start doing that. And I always remember that because she was right. So maybe a maybe a balanced approach then Yeah, try to get into the middle. Yeah. Try to to take some risks sometimes because generally people will understand what you're trying to say. I think for those of us who enjoy reading, reading can help with your fluency because it gives you more words in your vocabulary bank. But not just the words, also understanding how people use those words. So that's why also uh, watching videos or listening to podcasts can help you because it's not just about learning vocabulary, it's about 
seeing what people do with those words and how they react in certain situations and how they put their sentences together. And that can really help with your fluency too, if you observe other people. But at some point, you're going to have to do it. <laughs> so there's lots of things you can do to help you to, to be a better speaker or a more fluent speaker. But the only way to really do that is to practice speaking. Yeah, who, who would, who, no way past who would have thought that? <laughs> the only way to, to improve is to practice. As anyone who's ever learned a musical instrument or played a game of tennis would <laughs> know, you have to practice to, to get better. That's the same with a language, obviously, as well. Yeah, and do it in, in situations that are not a big deal. So if you use another language at work, don't don't wait till there's an important meeting with your client to practice your English. You know, go for a coffee with someone or make a new friend or practice in situations where it doesn't matter if you make mistakes because then you can grow in confidence and then you can do those more scary things like giving a presentation or talking to clients or, you know, trying to sell your products or whatever you're doing. You know, don't wait till it's something really important because you're going to be nervous anyway. So build up some confidence in, in nice, relaxed settings. Yeah, that's um, absolutely. That makes good sense. Now, on your website, EnglishWithKirsty.com, apart from your excellent newsletter that I've been following for a long time. Thank you very much. <laughs> and your podcast as well on English with Kirsty, that's called English with Kirsty. You tend to focus quite a lot on business English and, and having business clients as well. Is that, I think you used to work as a communications manager. Do you bring that background into your, I suppose the question is, why do you enjoy working with business clients? Yes, I do. I think a lot of the jobs that we've had in the past can help us in some ways, especially my, my role in communications helped me because whilst I wasn't teaching English or even using other languages there, I did see sometimes that people had really good ideas and then they struggled to express them either in writing or in situations like important meetings. And I thought, you know, that's a shame because they've got so much to, to say, so much to offer. Um, and part of my role within communications was to facilitate that a bit more. And that's not so different from what I do now as a teacher, because obviously there is the language teaching element. Really, for me, it was a progression because I started in 2012 by saying, OK, I work with adults because... I don't want to work with children. Me, me neither. <laughs> we agree on that. So that, that was, it started off with, okay, I work with adults. And I work with adults online because I don't want to, well, most of my business doesn't come from the UK. So, you know, I, I work with adults online. That makes sense. Um, but as I, I carried on, I found that a lot of the people that were coming to me either wanted to use English at work uh, and I could help them with that or... They were business owners, and, and that's what I'm doing a lot more of at the moment with people with small businesses who either want to sell their products or services in other countries and, and they're using English, not necessarily England, but, you know, because it's an international language, or they want to go to conferences or they want to start their own podcast or videos and, and they want some help with that. So I really enjoy that because they're people who are very motivated because they, they know that it's their business, it's their project. Or for those who are working for companies, it's their career. So they tend to be very motivated people who, who want to learn and who want to be able to concentrate on the thing that they do well without worrying about the English. So if you have to give a presentation, I mean, that can be scary enough as it is, but if you can do so without worrying so much about how you'll do that in English, then your life is better for it because... It's one less thing to think about. So I, I really enjoy, I don't do so much, I don't do much at all um, exam prep. I like the things with Business English because you see results. You see, oh, I got that job or I did that presentation and it was fine. Or, you know, I I can now talk more in team meetings and people actually find out the ideas that I have because I'm not too scared to say them in English. And, and I feel good about that. I, I enjoy that, having some part to play in that. On the topic of presentations, you said sometimes everyday conversation can be more difficult than giving a planned and rehearsed presentation in front of an audience. And I heard that, I heard you say, I thought that really made me think because many, many people get really scared and nervous about public speaking and giving a presentation in front of an audience. Surely it's easier to have a more kind of relaxed small talk conversation but then when I thought about it more I think you're absolutely right it, it is more difficult isn't it sometimes to to just have chit chat with especially if you don't know someone if you're networking if you're 
at a conference trying to make contacts and meet people and find common ground, it, it must be quite, quite difficult, maybe more than rehearsing something. I think so. It's, it depends how much of a spontaneous person you are anyway. You yeah. know, some people love spontaneity and some people like a bit more structure. But I think just having a small talk with someone or going for a coffee with someone, it's, it's not predictable. You can't plan anything. Otherwise, you sound a bit like a robot. You, know, you can have your script and you can't deviate from that script. But real life isn't like that. So, yeah, sometimes that cup of coffee is, is the hardest one because the conversation could go anywhere. And really, it's not about having all the vocabulary that you need for any possible situation. It's about feeling OK to, to ask if you didn't understand something or to think, OK, how can I explain this in a different way? Or to ask some questions so you don't have to do all the talking. It's, it's finding strategies to make that a bit, a bit less stressful and a bit more enjoyable. Let's take a quick break here because I know you listen to this podcast to take your English to the next level. But what about your speaking? Is your fluency improving? Are you happy with your speaking skills? My conversation course focuses on making you a more confident and more fluent English speaker. You'll join me and a small group of motivated students and we'll meet on Zoom and have topical discussions, role plays, debates and presentations that will expand your vocabulary and help you express yourself effectively in English. So be proactive and take the first step towards becoming a confident and fluent English speaker. Send me an email today to craig at englezpodcast.com and I'll send you details of the next online conversation course. Thanks for listening. Now, let's get back to the podcast. Some of my students, and perhaps you, you've experienced this too with your students, they, they have problems with awkward silences where they're struggling for words and vocabulary they're trying to come up with an effective phrasal verb or a nice collocation or some nice adjectives and voca advanced vocabulary and they they stutter and they pause and they there's that awkward silence how can they get over that have you got any advice for for maybe more advanced learners who have that nervousness when they're speaking yeah i think the more you focus on it you will forget the things that you already know so you know, take a deep breath and just give yourself a couple of seconds or even say oh I'll start that again or I need a minute and, and then don't make it a big deal because the other person probably doesn't feel as bad as you do because you're the one feeling embarrassed so just take your time but also don't try to have the whole sentence in your mind because that's not how we speak you know I know what I'd like to talk about but I don't rehearse the whole sentence in English before I say it our mind is is working a few words ahead of what we're saying but it's if you try to hold a really long and complicated sentence in your mind to, to create it and then to speak it that is a lot more pressure and it's not the way that we normally communicate so sometimes it is good if you are feeling a bit stressed you know keep it simple you can always add more complex vocabulary when you feel a bit more confident but if you if you're already feeling a bit stressed then it's more important to have the conversation and to get some of your ideas across than to, to freeze so it's good if you can keep the conversation going, keep it simple, and then you know start adding other words, other expressions in. But you don't have to, to show off for people to, to like you. They'll either like you or they won't. <laughs> but it's more important that you get your ideas across because then they'll know, you know, who is this person that I'm talking to? And sometimes we can appear to be someone else if we're so focused on not having any, any silences or not making any mistakes and if you listen to people or even yourself using their first language sometimes we forget a word or we change our mind about what we're going to say it's it's normal human behavior and sometimes I think we set the standard a lot higher when we're working in another language and that puts extra pressure on ourselves and of course then it's harder <laughs> because you, you're already putting pressure on yourself so try to take a deep breath to, to you know think okay I'll, I'll start that sentence again and then just carry on like it's it's normal because we do that in our first language too 
Yeah, exactly. And that point you made about simplifying language is advice I give to students preparing for an exam, because sometimes they're they're looking for a word they can't they they know they should use this word they can't remember what it is. Just describe it in very simple, very easy English and keep going. It's much better to avoid that awkward silence by just simplifying your language to a basic level. And let's face it, native speakers don't have an incredibly wide, advanced vocabulary when they're having everyday conversations. It might get higher in a job interview, perhaps, or in a business meeting, a formal situation. But day to day, we don't we don't have a very wide vocabulary when we're chatting. And it can sound a bit pretentious if you try, like you're showing off, or you're trying to say, "I'm better than you because I know this word." And Maybe children do that if they learn a new word and they think it's really cool, especially if the parents don't know what it means. But generally, <laughs> we don't do this. So you don't need to do it in another language either. I know you have groups for discussion and practicing speaking. How do you deal with difficult or sensitive topics or situations in those groups? Do you have very general discussions about non-sensitive topics or do you like to be a bit adventurous and would you talk about anything as long as it's open to discussion? I think it's important if you're creating a group environment that people feel safe, that people feel that if something is is likely to be a a focus of the session and it's something that's quite sensitive and, and problematic that it's good to be able to opt into that or not so I would say that I generally don't I I like to keep a, an eye on whatever I'm doing whether it's my group on LinkedIn or my groups on on Zoom I like to be aware of what's going on and I think if somebody says something that is inappropriate or that makes somebody else not feel comfortable I would want to address that because I, I care about the whole group I think it's possible to have discussions around topics that may be controversial. I mean, I only work with with adults. I mean, I'm open to talking about, I don't know, political questions or things like that, as long as everybody is respectful. And if they can't do that, we either have a word with the people who can't do that or, or change the topic. So I don't think, I think there are some topics that, that I would stay away from if, if I thought that they might make people feel uncomfortable, but I think it's important to be able to have a, a respectful discussion within a group. But I think as a, a group leader, then you also have a responsibility to make sure that the discussion is, is managed in a, in a good way and, and in a way that people feel safe to participate and also to, to be there. Yeah, absolutely. Especially with, with respect to other, other people in the group. So people wanting to find your groups, are they accessible on Englishwithkirsty.com? They are. So the, the groups, I, I have group courses, but the, I also have um, conversation groups. So they are not courses. They, they are an opportunity for people to, to come and speak and we have a topic and I facilitate the discussion, but that, that's not like a, a speaking class. But for the one-to-one and group courses, then then there are also options to to have group sessions as well. And then the the newest thing is my translators groups, which is for um, it's a course for translators who spend all their time working with texts and they don't speak. So perhaps they're translating from English into another language, but they want to attend conferences and things like that, or to talk to other translators at events. And if they haven't had many opportunities to speak, then Sometimes that can be a bit daunting if you don't need to speak. So this is this is a course, especially for people in this situation, talking about things that are relevant to translators. So that's my newest project. There will be links in the show notes at inglespodcast.com. If you're interested, go and have a look at Kirsty's website. Now, the busy language learner. I have a student who's very, very busy. And if she's listening, you know who you are. <laughs> what advice do you have for the busy language learner? Let's say they have a family, a couple of kids, they're working full time. And let's face it, they've got more important priorities than learning English. What would you suggest they do, if anything? I mean, they shouldn't just give up on, on their desire to improve their English. They should find some way to incorporate it into their busy schedules. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we, we're all kind of busy in some way. Um, I know that I'm super busy and I also want to learn a language, especially my, my Portuguese, which is my newest one. How, do, how, are, you do, how are you doing it then? It's hard. <laughs> um, I think... You have to be honest with yourself. 
and say, okay, if I really want to do this, I do need to find some time. It may not be as much time as I'd like, but I do need to, if I'm going to make this commitment to myself, I do need to sometimes prioritize these things, otherwise it won't get done. But I think there are lots of other ways you can do it that you can stack tasks. So I listen to podcasts when I'm cleaning the house or when I'm doing sport so that I'm, I'm getting some input in the language when I'm doing something else. Um, sometimes people have journeys to work where they're on the train or driving, then you can listen to something then. If you're going to watch series or Netflix, you know, try and find one in English. Maybe you can find some English music or find some English speaking friends so that some of the, maybe they have some children and you could all go on a go to the park or something, but speak English while the kids are playing. I don't know, there's lots of creative ways to make sure that it doesn't take any more time, but to to do something involving English at the same time as something you were going to do anyway. Yeah. So that would be my advice. (laughs) I love the idea of using what I call dead time. You're driving or you're on the train or the bus and you're maybe cleaning your flat, you're doing something, or even just standing in a queue. You could open an app and do some vocabulary work on your phone if you're if you're waiting for a shop to open or something something yeah exactly using that dead time it it might only seem to be just five minutes but it does mount up it does build day after day using that time that you're just sitting there doing nothing and that's another point you know 10 minutes five ten minutes every day is better than trying to find an hour at the weekend because you didn't do anything all week exactly exactly little and often is (laughs) yeah (laughs) and it's it's more effective for language learning according to the studies as well So how do you think, I mean, you must have heard and probably be using AI technology, the recent developments in tech. How do you see that influencing the way people learn languages and teach languages in the future? Anything occurred to you? I mean, I've started using some of them. I know my students are. Do your students ask you about? Um, It's not something we've really touched on. I mean, I know some teachers are using it to generate materials, and I think... As with anything, if you're going to do that, then you need to check it yourself just to make sure that it is correct. It it does do the job that you want it to do. I mean, it can save time, but it also needs to be fair to your students. And therefore, you need to check it to make sure there aren't errors. Um, I've seen people using it to explain things, but I've also seen some not so good explanations. So I think if you if you don't understand something, you can you can ask it to give you like a simple explanation for something. But at the same time. You need to know enough to know whether that's correct, what you're being given. So I think I think there's a place for it, but I think we can't rely on it entirely without, without checking the output because sometimes there will be errors. Yeah, absolutely. You've got to double check what comes out of these AI systems just to make sure they're okay. There is quite a nice one I've been recommending lately, and that's TalkPal AI. There'll be a link in the show notes, T-A-L-K-P-A-L. Dot AI, which is just like chatting to someone. It's very, very good. It gives you 15 free minutes a day and it will also answer your English questions. So um, that's that's one to have a look at. So you talk to it or you type to it? You talk to it. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a... And it answers you as a normal person would. It's, it's quite scary. <laughs> <laughs> it really is, but it's fun to play with. Okay. Yeah. I've never heard of it. Okay, so... One final question. What's the most enjoyable aspect of language teaching for you, Kirsty? Mm, that's hard because there are two. I mean, <laughs> I Okay, like, give us both. I like the stories. I mean, I've always been interested in, in people and I I'm, feel really fortunate that I can work with people from different places with different stories and different experiences. So I, I really like to, to learn those because, okay, I'm teaching English, but I'm also learning. I think every day I, I learn something new from my students. So I find it really interesting that I can learn so much about different cultures and, and, and different people and, and have that people contact because I really enjoy talking. And the second thing, um, maybe should have been the first thing, but <laughs> to see people becoming more confident and, and more relaxed and happier and to be themselves in English, because that's one of the things that I talk about a lot. You know, we, we know who we are, but then when we start using another language, Sometimes other parts of our personality come out more and that's that's a nice thing. But sometimes we aren't quite able to be ourselves yet because maybe we don't have the vocabulary and, and maybe we don't feel confident enough to, to make the jokes we would make in our first language or to, to react in the way that we would, um, especially people who like talking as much as I do. 
um, because that's a lot of words to find in another language. So I really like it when other people can start to be themselves and to relax and, and to enjoy using another language without some of the feelings of well, or being nervous or, or not knowing if what they're saying is right. So I, I like seeing people have more fun when they're learning other languages. Do you feel like there's an English Kirsty and a German Kirsty? Do you feel you're slightly different when you switch from one to the other? Yeah, I've got four. <laughs> I've got four <laughs> Kirsties in here. Um, <laughs> I guess the English Kirsty and the German Kirsty are, are closer to one another because the, the German is my, my strongest, uh, the German Kirsty has m- most words and German is my strongest language. But the sense of humour is different. The way you interact might be different. The cultural references are different. Yeah, I think I think that's the difference. So like with German Kirsty, she may behave a bit differently, but she's still able to say everything she wants to say and, and to, to be herself. Whereas the Portuguese Kirsty doesn't talk to anyone. She's like, no, <laughs> don't talk to me. I don't want to talk to you. Um, because, you know, that's that's my beginner language and I, I don't feel that I can be myself I'm very quiet if, if my teacher asks me something I will answer her but it's with fewer words and look down and speak quietly and that's not me so if other parts of your personality come out that's fine but if you can't be yourself because you're not at the level that you want to be then that's that's something that you can get help with or you can do things to help yourself and, and hopefully bring those two personalities a bit closer. I can't think of a better way to to end. So, Kirsty, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. How can listeners find out more about you and follow you on social media? You can come to englishwithkirsty.com and sign up for the newsletter if you'd like to, or you can just have a look around, see what's there. I spend most of my time on LinkedIn, so you can look for Kirsty Wolf on LinkedIn, and then you can connect with me there as well. Or you can email me at Kirsty K I R. S-T-Y at englishwithkirsty.com. And links to everything that we've spoken about and Kirsty's social media will be on the website in the show notes at inglespodcast.com. And uh, thank you again, Kirsty, and I hope we can do this again soon. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Many, many thanks to Kirsty for joining me on the podcast today and sharing her insights and her knowledge. The link to Kirsty's website and her social media will be in the show notes of this podcast and you'll find those at inglespodcast.com slash 509, 509. And now it's your turn to practice your English. Are you being proactive when it comes to improving your fluency? If you're not, what is holding you back? What is preventing you from taking your speaking to the next level? Are you a busy language learner with no spare time, a full-time job, a family to take care of? Or maybe there's another reason. Please let us know. You can do that by sending us a voice message. Go to speakpipe.com. That's S-P-E-A-K-P-I-P-E dot com slash English podcast. Or you could send us an email with a comment or question Emails go to me, Craig, C-R-A-I-G, at inglespodcast.com or Belfast Reza to contact Reza, that's R-E-Z-A, Belfast Reza, at gmail.com. If you're a Spanish speaker and you want to study for free, why not visit the Mansion Ingles website? And to get some paid ebooks and audios for self-study, have a look at the online store at store, S-T-O-R-E dot mansioningles.net. And before I go out the door this week, a huge thank you to all of our wonderful Patreon supporters. And you too can join our Patreon program for as little as $1.50 per month. And by doing that, you get instant access to the transcriptions of this podcast so that you can read every word that you hear. For more information, go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash English podcast. I don't have time to mention everybody who is supporting us on Patreon, but here are our latest supporters who have joined us this month. Many thanks to Josmar de Brito, 
Fran Otero, Oscar, David La Pietra, Juan Alejandro, Samuel Perez, and Juan Gatti. Thank you to you and to everybody who is supporting us on Patreon. In next week's episode, Reza will be back with me and we're going to talk about prisons and criminal rehabilitation. So join us next week for some vocabulary and conversation on that topic. If you enjoyed this podcast, please tell your friends so that more people can listen. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful week and we'll be back next Sunday. The music in this podcast is by Pitts. The track is called See You Later.